Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Yeah, so I'm excited uh, for today. I want to welcome you to church. Uh, my name is Dustin. My wife, Beth, and I, she's in the front row right there with a shirt that says love more, which is amazing. Um, that's like our motto, right? Love more. Anyway, that's my wife, Beth. She's amazing. We're the pastors here, and it's an honor uh, to be here uh, with you today. Uh, that's my daughter, too. If you don't know, that's my daughter. That's Jane. She's staying in here today, I guess. <laughs> But uh, man, I'm excited uh, for today. We're continuing our series. If you've been with us the past few weeks, I know last week um, was the coldest temperature I think I've ever experienced in my entire life. Um, and that's for real. Like in my, it was minus 42 degrees Celsius when I got to my car last Sunday morning, um, which is it's just quite cold, I'll be honest. Um, and uh, so I know there's a lot of us who couldn't make it last week, and I'm like, that's cool, you know? <laughs> like, like if I had the choice, you know, I don't know. What I've come, I don't know. If my car started, it did start though. Um, but uh, if you missed the last couple of Sundays, maybe you watched us online, we've been kind of in this series um, that we've called Required. Um, and we're going through a verse that uh, God, um, I feel like God spoke to me kind of for our church um, for 2024. And I like to start, um, usually how we start our year is we usually do kind of, we have a conversation on prayer and we talk about prayer. But, you know, as I was kind of preparing for the new year, this is what God was speaking to me. And, and I really was feeling, you know, to share this, kind of what God has placed in my heart for our church um, for uh, the next year. Um, and it's really cool. Not, not always does God, you know, speak to me a verse for a year. Uh, it hasn't happened very often, but I was really feeling it this year. Um, and so we're in Micah chapter 6, uh, verse 8. And this is what the verse that we have as a church this year is. is Micah 6, 8 is this. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is the verse that I've been feeling God has been speaking to me. And uh, we had two messages out of this series already. Um, week one, uh, just kind of an introduction into the book of Micah, kind of the context it was written in and what it means for us. And, and if you haven't listened to it, I'd encourage you to go and, and, and go back because when we read scripture, it's really important that we take context into it. Um, that, that, we, that we understand what it was written for and who it was written for and why. Um, and so just briefly, basically Micah, prophet, heard from God, kind of a, a message for the nation that was really going against their corruption, cor their corruption, their injustice, and their greed kind of a nation. Um, and so this is kind of the context this is written in. And this is almost like the answer to that problem is how do we overcome that? How do we overcome greed? How do we overcome corruption in our, in our culture, in our society? And this is what Micah wrote. And, and basically the steps are to act justly, which we talked about last week. And number two, to love mercy. And then we're, next week, we're gonna be concluding with a message called walk humbly. Um, but what does the Lord require is really the, the context of what we're talking about through this series. What does the Lord require? And the answer is what he's already shown us, right? He has shown you, oh human, he has shown you what is good. So God has already shown us how to do this, but he, he's kind of reiterating it and saying, okay, this is what God has shown you. He's, told, he's shown you how to act. He's shown you what to love and he's shown you how to live. Now go out and do it. Like actually live this out. And we, we, we need to learn to act in a place of justice. And as we went through last week, just briefly, uh, we answered the question, what is justice? And Timothy Keller, pastor, said it this way. He said this, justice is being radically generous, fighting for universal equality, striving to give life-changing advocacy and being asymmetrically responsible. And that's how we act. That's the characteristics. Um, those of us who follow Jesus, that's how we're supposed to live our lives. If we want to overcome greed and we want to overcome uh, injustice in our culture, in our society, this is how we do it. What does the Lord require? And then it goes into what we're supposed to love. And this is what we're going to talk about today. And what are we supposed to love is mercy. We are to love mercy. So the question is really is what is mercy? 
So as any, as I do, I don't know what you do when you don't know what a word means. I go right to Google. And I know what it means, but you know what I mean? Like, like I went to Google to, to find out what does mercy actually mean? I think sometimes we get, you know, the meaning of words kind of shifts as, as we go through time, as it goes through. But this is what mercy means. It means compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is when, within one's power to punish or harm. So somebody who has the power, who has the strength, who might have the title, they might have the position, they might have the ability to cause harm or to punish, yet they choose to forgive. They choose to show compassion. They choose to show mercy. So rather than even retaliation, they show mercy to someone. They use their, 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 their gift to lift people up. This is what true strength is, right? That we might have the power... And if you know, as parents, we have the power, we, we have the strength, but that doesn't mean that we use our power to only punish and harm our children. We use our power to love and take care of them and forgive them and hopefully lead them in the ways they should go to grow up, to follow Jesus and do the same. But this is what true strengthens. Those who are the most powerful using their power to serve people, not take from people using their power to care for people and not harm people, using their power to lift people up, not push people down, people who are quick to forgive and are slow to anger. And one thing that we know is that we serve an omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient God. And what this means is that he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and he's everywhere all at the same time. And he has the title of God. He has the position of author and creator and savior. And this is how Micah describes God later on in his book that he wrote. In in Micah chapter 7, verse 18, it says this. And this is really beautiful. It says this. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. It's a beautiful verse. You got to remember the context of, of, of the situation Israel was in in this moment. It wasn't a, the best place to be. Prophets were being bribed to give specific words so that they could build themselves up. There was so much corruption and greed going in culture. And I don't know if you've seen some, some things in our culture that might feel the same way. But who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. What has God already shown you? Who is a God like our God who forgives and doesn't just show mercy because it's the right thing to do, who delights in showing mercy? You could define delight as great pleasure. We could read it as, a, as our God takes great pleasure in showing you and I mercy. What a beautiful place and position for him to posture himself in relationship to us. Those of us so broken and hurting that he came to serve us and delight in showing us mercy. He loves mercy. God loves mercy. It's part of his character. He delights in it. Yet if you know in our culture, mercy isn't often what we like to see, right? We like to, like I said last week, we like people to get what they deserve, right? You work less hard than me at work, you better not be making more than me, right? Better not. I deserve more. This is what our culture teaches us is that in order for us to succeed, other people have to fail. In order for me to get the promotion, no, they can't get the promotion, But we serve this God who has the right to be angry. The right to not let us into his family. The power to wipe us out in a moment. But what does he do? He doesn't do that. He's the one who knows all the intricate parts of who we are. Who knit us together in our mother's womb. Who knows how many hairs are on our head. Who knows our deepest wounds and our deepest weaknesses. But as well knows our biggest strengths and our greatest victories. The God who's all-knowing. And what does he do? He delights in showing us mercy. That's unbelievable. 
I think that one concept, like if we were to fully grasp how powerful and all knowing and how amazing he is, yet this is how he loves us. Delights in showing us mercy. He delights so much in showing us mercy. What did he do? He came to earth to die instead of us. To take the punishment instead of us. That's the mercy he showed. He doesn't just say, I forgive you. He says, I'm going to take your place. He didn't cause us to sin, but what happened is he gave us the solution. The one who jumped into the water to save us, not just throw us a manual on learning how to swim. He jumped in the water with us. Not just yell at us from the boat and teach us. He jumps in and rescues us. Even though some of us in some context, me, we don't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. But he still gave his life for us. And this is how Jesus taught it. This is a parable that he, that he shares in, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. It's the parable of the unforgiving debtor. Maybe you know this story. And this is, this is so powerful in here. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me seven times? Peter's like, I'm the best, right? Like seven whole times I'm going to forgive somebody? Like, come on. Jesus is going to think I'm awesome. That's not the response he gets, right? You know, right? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven or 77 times, right? Like an astronomically bigger number than seven times. And then he goes on. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. That's a lot of money. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. It's a tough. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay. Be patient, please. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Wow. When the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat. Now, this is very like, <laughs> like descriptive. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. Um, Jane, our daughter, who's sitting right there, my beautiful daughter, she loves to pick up her sister. She, she does. The other day, I'm sitting on the couch, and I hear Beth say, Jane, don't pick up your sister by the neck. I'm like, yeah, probably not. Probably dangerous. But we're still learning in our house, right? But he grabs him by the throat and demands instant payment. He received the mercy, and then he says, you give me what you owe me. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Please, be patient with me. I will pay it. He pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When the other, some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. Fair enough. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt. Millions. Because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. This is a crazy story, right? Obviously a parable. Verse 35, that's what my heavenly father will do if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Like, this is a very, like, intense and, for me, convicting thing to read. Right? For me. I, maybe not for you. Maybe you're like, you got it, right? But for me, like, there's so many times where I'm so willing. When I mess up, I love to receive forgiveness. But when someone else messes up, I'm like, ah, it's going to take me a little bit more time. And this is just part of being human, I think. But everything that Jesus taught, imagine you're sitting there, Right? Jesus is looking, he's looking and he's sharing deep and impactful and new ideas that are countercultural. 
and you're taking notes, you're writing it down, you're learning. You're like, yeah, Jesus, get him, right? Get him, Jesus. Sick him. And then you realize that you're a big part of the problem too. Ever feel that way when you read the Bible? You're like, yeah, go get those guys. And you're like, he's after me too, you know? See, a lot of Jesus' teaching was so countercultural, and it still is today. It's very, it's, it's very amazing because what's so beautiful about it is that it's not about us. Have you noticed that? When you read through the Bible, you feel encouraged because of what God did, not what you did. It's not about us. It goes against the ways of the world. It goes, away, it goes against the ways of greed and injustice in our culture. Even as Micah was addressing it in his context, the ways of self-promotion and of pride, the ways of using people to build your kingdom, not serving alongside people to build his kingdom. It's, it, it's so much about us about how big we can build our own following, our own thing. And Jesus is saying, I'm so much more important. You know, if we don't love mercy, it's going to be really hard to receive his mercy. Again, I think a lot of us, we love to receive mercy. We love that God forgives us and that God gave his life for us. But then we think about the person who hurt us in the most challenging, even traumatic way, and we think, not them, though. You wouldn't, not them, though. How could you forgive them? You know what they did? Mercy isn't just an emotion we feel, it's an action we take. It's not just something, mercy isn't just something we feel like, wow, I have mercy for you, but it's something we do. It's we see oppression or we see injustice or we see difficulty. And we don't just say, wow, that sucks. We go make a difference. We bring Jesus into it to stand up to injustice to fight for what's right, to fight for equality, to fight for the basic needs of hum humans to be met. The fight for rights and access for everyone. To give to missions so we have and we give. We have so we serve. We have so we bless. We have so we encourage. We have so we pray. We have so we carry one another's burdens. The ones who have a debt to pay. And Psalm 23 verse 6 says this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is what I think the dream is, right? We all want goodness and mercy to follow us wherever we go. Of course we do. Because it's good and it's mercy. What we don't want to have following around is evil and corruption and injustice. See, the closer we are to Jesus, the more goodness and mercy we will see. The more of his heart we experience, the more we dwell in his presence, the more mercy and goodness we will see. And not only will we see, we will carry it. Carry his goodness. Carry his mercy where we go. It will follow us in the sense of God pouring it out to us. And in the sense of mirroring that same goodness and that same mercy. I want to invite up uh, Micah to come play wherever he's at. But I want to end with this story from the book of Acts. And I th it's such a powerful story. It's the story of a man named Stephen, who was the first martyr uh, of the faith. The first person that we see killed in this way and in this context. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54 to 60.
And I think there's maybe some of our culture in this story too, but it says this, the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation. If you read through it, you'll get more context, but it says they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. He's just saying what he sees. Now, I don't know, maybe if they would have looked up, they would have seen it too, I don't know. But they were so focused on the anger and so focused on tradition and so focused on what they thought was hypocrisy and what they thought was a liar. They couldn't even witness or see what was above them. Their focus was so much on themselves and the injustice they thought and mercy was nowhere on their lips. You know how I know? This is then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. We don't want to hear it. Which is such a childish thing to do. I have kids. Like, that's what kids do, right? It's like, ah! You know, like, that's what they did. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this is the part that every time I read this, I know I have a lot of growing to do. It says, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Every time I read that, I'm like, man, like I, I got a lot of growing to do. I got a lot of faith building to do. Imagine if we could get to that same place in our faith. Where mercy is what's on our lips, even in the worst of moments. Even in the hardest times. Even in the middle of injustice being shown toward us and greed and all of it. That even in persecution and animosity. Even in hardship. In the midst of corruption, we can pray a similar prayer to this. Don't charge them. In other translations of this say, don't hold this against them. Remember, Jesus' prayer was what? Forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. It's a similar cry. A similar cry of, it's not about me, even in this moment, even in my hardest moment, it's not about me. Their focus, their eyes, their minds are on how can I see other people come with me? I don't care about my life. I care about his life. And and I want to see people come with me to heaven. That's all it's about. See, Stephen experienced God's mercy. And he didn't just hold it. He shared it. He replicated it. He showed it. In his hardest moments. And I can probably think back to this week of my hardest moments and think, man, I wish I had more mercy on my lips. I wish I had more care. I wish I, 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 wish I wouldn't have said that or done that. I wish I would have. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that would be funny in, a, in your, your arguing with your wife. You're like, don't hold this sin against them, right? You know, like, <laughs> it would be so funny. <laughs> like, uh, maybe don't do that. I don't know. Like, depends on your heart in that context. Like, I don't know for sure. Don't hold this sin against them. Like, that would be crazy to say. Um, anyway. But what if we could get to that same place in our life, or that same place in our faith where mercy is on, is so a part of who we are that when we're squeezed, when life squeezes us, when life tries to wring us out, mercy is what people see. Do you know what it'll take for us to get to that place? Dedication to growing closer to Jesus. And experiencing his goodness and his mercy. 
and see it, his goodness and his mercy follow us. And then others will see and experience his mercy as well. You know, getting to a place where mercy is what is coming out, is, is what is on our mind, what is on our lips, what is in our actions to love mercy. That is not a, just, a, again, it's not just an emotion we feel. It's not just something that we feel like, yeah, I have mercy today. No, it's something we do. We show mercy. We love mercy. We don't just do it because the Bible tells us so. We do it because we love it. We love it. We love to see people experience the same forgiveness that I have experienced. The same mercy, the same love, the same joy, the same peace that I got. It's not just for me. We want to see others to see it and experience that same mercy. That we love it. Again, it said, God delights in showing us mercy. Could we get to a place as a church, as families where we love mercy too? We love to show it. We love to give it. Could we get to a point in our own relationship with Jesus that in the midst of all of the hard stuff, that's what people see? And our takeaway today, I've said it a few times, but mercy isn't an emotion we feel, but an action we take. It's something we do. So let's be filled with mercy. Because again, with great power comes great responsibility. You might be powerful. You might have the position. You might have the title. But what you do with that is really important. Just because you're powerful doesn't mean you're going to use it in the right way. To be honest, I don't really care what your title is. I need you to show me what your title is. See, Jesus, he had the title of God, right? Savior. And what did he chose to do? He chose to walk in the responsibility of a servant and wash his disciples' feet. See, I think what makes us powerful is not the letters we have beside our name. Not that we have children. I don't think that's what makes us good fathers is not just having a kid. It's putting in the work. Learning to be patient at bath time. When you got more water on the floor than in the bath now. And then they ask for more water. And you're like, next time, keep it in the bath. I know because I experienced this last night. We gotta learn to show mercy. It's not about the title we have. It's, you might have it, but are you willing to live it out? That God came to serve. Show us mercy. He taught us from the most intelligent being, he taught us how to live. The most creative taught us how to create and to live and to love. And that's who we serve. Let us take action against the injustice we see in the world. Let us stand up for love and fight for it. That we don't just show mercy, we love mercy. We love it. When we can see an injustice taken care of, when we can see people get even what they don't deserve, can we celebrate them? That's hard. When someone gets what you want, it's hard to celebrate them a lot of the time. Can we learn to celebrate people when they get what we want? Rather than frown and be like, God, why me? Be like, God, good for them. What if that was our attitude and our minds and, and how we lived our lives? I think it could transform so many things if our focus was so much more on others than it was on us. And that's really what we're going to be going through next week as we talk about walking humbly. But I just want to encourage you, let, let, let's let mercy fill our homes. Let's let mercy fill our church. Let's let mercy be a part of it. Yeah, people are going to do things. 
it's going to be hard, but we just show mercy. That's what's on our lips. So let's just pray together. God, I thank you that you are a merciful God. That you are all powerful, all knowing, and you're everywhere. Yet mercy is still what you showed us. God, we love you. And God, I pray that that same mercy that you showed, God, help us show it as well. Help us show mercy at work and on the white mud at 7, 15 a.m. Help us show mercy in our families, with our kids, with our spouses. That even when we mess up, God, help us be quick to forgive and slow to anger. God, we love you. And we thank you that you're moving in our church, God. That you're building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. You're building your church here in Canada. You're building your church here in Alberta. God, that you're raising up leaders in our midst. You're raising up leaders in our schools. You're raising up leaders in our universities. You're raising up leaders in our families to lead us closer to you. And God, I pray that, that God, you become just, God, that you move in our nation. You move in our government. You move in our, in our schools and in our cities. God, you're building your church. In Jesus' name, amen.